Hi, I'm Bill Perkins. Welcome to Compass TV. If you love the Lord, love your Bible, and love to learn, you're going to love this presentation. If you've been a believer for any time at all, you'll find yourself having to defend what you believe in the Bible. You'll be challenged about things like God's six-day creation week, Noah's worldwide flood, Jonah being swallowed by the great fish, and a lot more. Yet even older Christians can't defend Bible basics like these. Russ Miller, one of America's top Bible defenders, has come up with a short, concise answers list to the biggest topics in the Bible. You'll enjoy this presentation, 60 Second Answers to Tough Bible Questions by Russ Miller. Hey, it's great to be here today. Let me uh, open the afternoon session with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this afternoon and for every dear soul that's here today. I hope and, and pray you will just guide the speakers and the information that we share, that it will be a blessing to everyone here and help uh, gird us in our faith, even bring us to faith if necessary, and give us information we can share to help others. In Jesus' great name, I do pray. Amen. Amen. You know, the, the Bible tells us that we are to be ready to give an answer to every man that seeks for the reason in our, for the hope that's in our heart with meekness and with fear. Um, sometimes that can be a challenge. When someone's getting right in your face and yelling at you, sometimes, and maybe some of you saw some of that today, but sometimes you have to just stand strong and not compromise. You can't let someone just bowl you over. You need to stand your ground. But we need to do it with meekness and fear, with an ultimate goal of leading somebody to put their faith in the Word of God. Um, so let's take a look at answering skeptical questions. Uh, because certainly, uh, you know, it, it, there's nothing wrong with being a believer and having questions. You might be skeptical of something the Bible says, not in a negative way, but just naturally you don't understand what the Bible says or, or how God could have done something. I think there's nothing wrong with having questions, even if they're skeptical, as, you're, as long as you're not a scoffer or being a scoffer answering those. That's a different situation. You guys uh, may have heard of uh, Pastor Josh over the past two weeks. He had his 15 minutes of shame, I mean, excuse me, of fame, because he came out and he was all over the internet and the news, and he stated that the Bible is not the Word of God. The Bible is not inerrant or infallible. The Bible is not an answer book, and it's not a science book. Well, my friends, 90% of our seminaries basically teach this. This is not unusual. This is typical. It's the reason only 2% of churches will allow me to share the information I share. But when they, I'll tell you this, my experience is when someone says to you, a, 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 a Christian, that, uh, oh, the Bible's not a science book. We don't want to talk about that. It's because I guarantee you, they have accepted old earth beliefs that put death before Adam. They don't want to talk about it. So that is my experience. I'm sure uh, Pastor Josh is right there. Hey, I consider him a victim, and I don't mean to pick on him because I, he's, he's typical today, unfortunately. What he said, well, does he believe, what, what is the Bible? Well, he said the Bible is a human response to God, and it's living and dynamic. Living and dynamic, well, written by man, means it's not God's inspired word. It was written by, by inspired men, but he's saying, no, it's just written by man, and it's living in dynamic. Translation, you can make it say anything you want. And unfortunately, we see a lot of that today. However, the Bible tells us in 2 Peter, the prophecy came not by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Men wrote the Bible, and they were inspired by God to do so. One of the many things you can point to uh, to prove this, really, and this is what, what God said proves his word is the word of God, is prophecy. Most churches uh, avoid prophecy, which is really unfortunate because, wow, if I want to prove somebody the Bible is true, I, I don't need to talk about creation evolution issues. I, I'm going to go right to prophecy. You know, the Bible um, has about 1,800 prophecies in it, and I'd say about 95% of those have already been literally fulfilled. You know, in fact, God's word tells us the way you tell false uh, teachers and, and prophets and religions is their prophecies won't come true. Every religious text makes prophecies, and maybe one out of five, one out of ten come true, but 80 to 90% don't. The Bible is hundreds and hundreds for hundreds and hundreds. 
In fact, most of the remaining uh, prophecies that have not started or already come true are going to take place during the tribulation period. And we have many that are taking place right now. A lot of people say, gee, I wonder what it was like to live in biblical times. <laughs> My friends, you are living in biblical times. Wow, Israel becoming a nation again in one day blows me away. There's no Israel for almost 1,900 years. And the Bible keeps talking about Israel. Israel in the last days this, and Israel that. And, and it's going to become a nation again in one day. And, and it's going to return in, in non-belief. And they're going to return to speaking Hebrew. A lost language has never been revived in the history of the world. And on and on it goes. And all those have now taken place in the last handful of years. So let's take a look at not only answering skeptical questions, but also critical accusations today. Such as your Bible is filled with contradictions. Well, you know, for this, I would look at internal consistency. If there was a traffic accident out at this intersection this afternoon, and five of us were standing there and saw it, and if the police got there two minutes later and took all of our statements, all five statements would have tremendous variations within them, even though we all saw it and it only happened two minutes earlier. Now, the Bible, on the other hand, consists of 66 books written by 40 different authors. It ranged from kings and doctors to fishermen and shepherds. It was written in three different languages in 15 separate countries on three separate continents over a 1,500 year period of time. Yet it's one unified count with not a single contradiction that'll stand up to scrutiny. Wow, that is the fingerprint of it being the inspired word of God right there. But I always hear the Bible is full of mistakes. Well, Skeptics, and there are professional skeptics. For a year in Arizona, I had the Skeptic Society follow me around. Everywhere I went in Arizona, they showed up with anywhere from 5 to 15 members. And they would stand outside if it was a church service at the end, and, and they would hand out their tracts. They have, they have their own tracts, by the way. And they like to, to say these. So one of the ones that they will point to as, as a mistake in the Bible has to do with Jesus as he was leaving the town of Jericho. The book of Matthew says he encountered two blind men, while as uh, Mark and Luke say he encountered one blind man. And so they say this is an error, this is a mistake or a lie in the Bible. However, it's just an area people don't understand what they are actually seeing here. Earlier today, I was speaking with Andy Woods and with Dave Reagan. Now, after I got done, if I went over and told my wife Joanna, hey, I was just talking with Andy... And I went over to Bill Perkins and said, hey, I was, I was just talking to Dave Reagan. And then I stood in front of all of you and said, hey, I was just talking to Andy and Dave. All three statements would be different. All three states, statements would be true. And not one contradicts the other. No errors, no contradictions in the Bible that will stand up to scrutiny. Now, you may have to look into something, but they, the Bible stands up just fine. It's the most attacked book in the history of the world. We never have to change it. Um, so here's another. Why can't you acknowledge the Bible isn't infallible and has errors in it? Because every time someone tells me there's an error, if I have to research it, I will find out that they were wrong. The only error was in their thinking. Uh, for instance, this is one of the, the number one uh, supposed errors that skeptics will use. And this is what they use to mislead the majority of Christian kids. In 2 Chronicles 4... We're told about this huge brass bowl. I mean, this brass bowl is like about 18 feet in diameter. So it says, and I'm not going to break this down to inches. We're just going to use cubits. I'm going to just round things off here to save time. But we're told that this brass bowl is 10 cubits from brim to brim and 30 cubits round about. So it's 10 cubits across and 30 cubits round about. Now, the way you get the circumference, the distance round about of a circle, is you take the diameter, in this case 10 cubits, times pi, 3.14. Well, 10 times 3.14 should be 31.4 cubits, but the Bible says it's 30 cubits, and skeptics will tell you this is a mistake, a lie in the Bible. You can't trust the Word of God. It's not the Word of God they will say. 
And they use this. I hear this all the time. It's one of the first ones that they will bring up. However, if you read verse 5, you see that the thickness of the bowl, this is a huge brass bowl, it was a hand breadth thick. So it, this, this is a depiction looking down on that brass bowl. Now, the 10 cubits is from the outside brim to the outside brim. But what if we measure it from the inside of the brim to the inside of the brim? Well, if the hand breadth is just over four inches and you take off the four inches from both of the two sides, that's a little over eight inches, which is just under half a cubit. Well, 10 cubits minus just less than half a cubit is a little bit more than nine and a half cubits. Times pi is 30 cubits, round about. No error in the Bible, just an area where people didn't understand what they were being told. So when someone comes up to you with an error, mistake, or contradiction in the Bible, don't, don't worry about, gee, how do we prove this? Realize they're wrong, and you may have to do some research to find the answer. But don't let them plant seeds of doubt in your mind about God's word. How about this one? Your good book is full of rape, murder, and slavery. It's not the word of God. Well, first of all, it's got a lot worse in there than that. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> And, and the reason is, it is God's inspired word. It's the real deal. It's not a book of fairy tales. It's, got, it's the answer book to the world. And what it does is it, it shows the depravity our sinful natures are capable of so that we understand that sin is real and the only viable answer is a relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's the real deal. It's not a once upon a time book of fairy tales. What about this one? Face the facts. Dinosaurs alone prove life and death existed long before humans came about. Now, what's the first line in a secular dinosaur book you read to your kids and grandkids? 65 million years ago, dinosaurs went extinct. That is historical science. Who saw dinosaurs go extinct 65 million years ago? Who saw them go extinct 10,000 years ago? That is a belief, that's historical science. Assumptions based on the belief there is crust, the sedimentary layers form slowly and uniformly with no global flood, as 2 Peter 3 says. But see, what you've just done is you've just taught your children that death existed long before Adam. Later on, as kids are older, and you try to tell them by one man, sin entered the world and death by man's sin, separating us from God, requiring our redemption through Jesus. And they're going, wait a minute, Mom. Wait, wait a minute, Granddad. You've been telling me there was death and suffering for millions of years before man. Do you see the stumbling block? Did I mention we're losing 90% of our kids by the age of 20? Ooh, Satan is good at what he does. So how do dinosaurs fit into the biblical creation? That's a picture of my wife, Joanna, by the way. She's the pretty one with the white blouse on, right? <laughs> Right over here. <laughs> really? She, she is, really. <laughs> She's outside. We'll keep that between ourselves. <laughs> so let me, let me go through some information here. I, I want to I say before I show you this, if dinosaurs had been gone 60 plus million years before man came along, how much evidence of man and dinosaur living at the same time will there be? Absolutely nothing, right? Let me show you some information. You make your own decision what you want to believe. First of all, the word dinosaur was only invented in 1841, 170, uh, 80 years ago. Um, prior to that, they were called dragons and serpents. If you look in a dictionary today under the word dragon, you'll be told mythical creature. Here's a dictionary, 75 years old, dragon, now rare, a huge serpent. A fabulous animal. If you look in old dictionaries, 200 years old, under the word dragon, there won't be anything mythical about them. You know, ancient history books are full of thousands of accounts of man and dragons. We call those dragon stories today. Uh, but many of them sound like what we would call dinosaurs. Let me give you three examples that come out of what is now India. Uh, back in about 2,300 years ago, Alexander the Great, when he conquered that area, said that his soldiers were scared by the great dragons that lived there 2,300 years ago. Uh, 2,000 years ago, Pliny the Elder wrote that the elephants there are constantly at war with the dragons. 1,900 years ago, Polonius of Tyana wrote, the whole of India is girt with enormous dragons, killers of elephants. 
Well, it takes a big critter to kill and eat an elephant. We don't even have such critters today. So obviously something very different called dragons were in the area that we now call India, even 1,900 years ago. Think about this logically. We find cave drawings, rock carvings, metal carvings, etc., of dinosaurs all over the world. Now picture this on a timeline. Well, here we are today. We're told that these were made 700 to 2,000 years ago. We didn't recognize dinosaur bones till 200 years ago. If we didn't recognize dinosaur bones till 200 years ago, how come people all over the world know what they look like 700 to 2,000 years ago? I mean, someone had to see them, right? In New Mexico, this rock drawing of a duckbill dinosaur was found a few years back. And um, the interesting thing, they, they said it was made about 1,200 years ago, but it was striped. They call, they, the person who made the drawing had it striped like a zebra. So the, the evolutionists that discovered this, they were laughing at that. Well, there's no way he could have known it was striped like a zebra. They've been gone 65 million years. Then they found a mummified duck-billed dinosaur in, in South Dakota a few years later, about 15 years ago. It was mummified. The skin was preserved. And it was striped like a zebra. <laughs> Somebody had to see them. Over the last 20 years, more than 50 non-fossilized dinosaur bones have been found that still have red blood cells, amino acids, genetic information, and even soft, flexible dinosaur tissues in them. They, those layers laid down by water in which these remains are found, they were laid down by water <laughs> in what's known as a global flood. Well, wait a minute. Archaeology proves the Bible is historically flawed. Really? Well, world-renowned archaeologists Nelson Gluick and William Albright stated the Bible is the single most accurate source document from history. And neither one is a Christian, by the way. So, our Israeli archaeologists used the Bible to find King David's palace back in 2005, and they said what's amazing about the Bible is it's amazingly accurate. <laughs> Archaeology in the Bible rests with no problem. Well, wait a minute. Astronomy proves the universe is billions of years old. Who saw the universe form billions of years ago? That's historical bias. Uh, assumptions masquerade into science, by the way. This from New Scientist magazine. Volcanic activity on the moon indicates it formed just a few million years ago. Not billions of years ago. Oh, wait a minute. If there's volcanic activity on the moon, couldn't that mean it formed just a few thousand years ago? <laughs> Absolutely. Jupiter is a very hot planet, but it's cooling off. It's losing heat twice as fast as it takes it in from the sun. Yet it's still a hot planet. It can't be millions of years old or it would have cooled into an ice ball by now. Exploded stars are known as supernovas. Uh, at the rate that we have observed exploded stars and at the rate we see them uh, form, there's only enough remnants in exploded stars to represent about 7,000 years worth of time. Uh, the astronomy in the Bible is not in conflict with real science, operational science. Stars. They put the Hubble telescope up. It hovers about 350 or floats about 353 miles above the surface of the Earth. And they put a tremendously powerful telescope on it. And they, they aimed it into outer space and left the lens open for 96 hours. They wanted to capture the first light from right after the Big Bang and prove the Bible wrong. So they left it open for 96 hours, developed the film, and what they found were literally millions of spiral round galaxies, each made of billions of stars. So they actually prove that the uh, numbers of stars in heaven are equivalent to the uh, grains of sand on the beach, which God told Abraham 3,000 years ago. But the problem that they have is if, if the uh, universe were even 50 million years old, the spiral galaxies should have lost their shape and the stars would be evenly distributed. This is called the winding up dilemma. They have a lot of dilemmas. The universe is too white, tightly wound to be but a few thousand years old. In fact, this uh, astrophysicist and geophysicist with a high altitude observatory in Colorado stated, I suspect, I believe the sun is four and a half billion years old, but we could live with just a few thousand years. I don't think we have much in the way of observational evidence and astronomy to conflict with that. It's beliefs 
assumptions, biased assumptions, historical science, real science that you can test and observe does not undermine and go against the word of God. You may have heard this one before. If your God didn't make the sun till the fourth day, how did you have days one, two, and three? Well, you know, a day is one spin of the earth upon its axis. It doesn't have anything to do with the sun. So there was one day, two days, three days. Pretty simple answer, right? I bet you've heard this one before. It takes light millions of years to reach earth. How could God have gotten light here in a six-day creation? Well, first of all, he got it here on the first day of creation by a spoken word. That usually doesn't help the situation when I point that out. But again, the Bible is the only book to live on its ability to correctly predict the future. In 2 Peter 3, 3 through 6, we have one of the greatest prophecies that have to do with what we deal with today, where we're told they'll come in the last day scoffers, saying, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. That's uniformity. We talked about that earlier today. Uniformity is a key belief today in secular Old Earth teachings. And these scoffers claiming uniformity are going to be willingly ignorant. They're going to choose to ignore that by the word of God, the heavens were of old. The heavens were of old. They're going to deny this. Uh, when the Bible is talking about the fourth day of creation, it says that God made the stars to be seen for seasons, days, and years. Notice that the author of Genesis knows the difference between a day and a year, by the way. But did you know that light travels 186,282 miles per second through our atmosphere? You probably knew that. Did you know that scientists have slowed light to 30 miles an hour? Did you know that scientists have brought light to a dead stop and captured it and re-released it? Did you know that scientists working in conjunction with Princeton were able to speed light impulses to 300 times the speed of light? I think it was 355 million miles per second. My contention is this. If mankind with our finite little brains can play around with the speed of light, the creator of the universe has no issues getting light where he wants it, when he wants to get it there. Don't doubt God because mankind can't do something. That's our mistake, not God's mistake. In fact, we're told uh, through Moses by the inspiration of God that God has judged man's sin once already with a flood of waters that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven. That would be a global flood. Now here's a common statement I get. Get over it. Geology proves there's no evidence of a global flood. I think I showed you a bit of evidence earlier this morning, but let's go back to that uh, prophecy in 2 Peter 3. These scoffers are going to claim uniform processes and be willingly ignorant that God made the heavens of old, but also that the world that was being overflowed with water perished. One of the great prophecies in the New Testament for the last days is scoffers would claim uniform processes and deny there was ever a global flood. If there's anyone sitting here who still says it was just a local flood, I hope I have challenged you enough to humble yourself to the Word of God. If there was a global flood, we should find the crust of the earth made up of sedimentary layers of rock that were stratified out by grain size, weight, and density by moving water. We should find millions of fossils that were drowned and buried in those layers very quickly before they had time to rot away or get eaten by scavengers. I left my home in Arizona a month ago. I was speaking at a church in California. And um, about two miles down the road, someone had run over a raccoon right in the middle of the road. Squished it, deader than a doornail. I came back four days later. Scavengers had already eaten it. I thought for sure it lay there for millions of years waiting for strata to build up around it, but <laughs> things have to be buried immediately to be preserved so they can become fossils. But we should find no transitional fossils of one kind evolving into another Darwinian macro style, and we should find polystrata fossils that go through multiple strata. If 
there was a global flood. We should also find fossils of the seafloor uh, sea drilling creatures in the lowest layers because they lived at the bottom of the sea. We should find marine fossils throughout all layers since they were laid down by water. And we should find the land dwellers in the upper layers because during the first 150 days of the flood, as the fountains of the deep were erupting, they could move to higher and higher ground, be the last things drowned and buried. And my friends, all that is exactly what we find. It's not somewhat what we find. It is exactly what we find. The old earth beliefs are based on those layers not forming during a flood, but forming slowly and uniformly, just like the Bible said they would do. So please, stop agreeing with the secular atheists. It's not the way to go. Well, didn't the Colorado River carve out Grand Canyon over millions of years of time? No. Colorado River had absolutely nothing to do with the formation of Grand Canyon. I lead Grand Canyon tours, have for oh, probably about 17 or 18 years. I've rafted, I used to lead raft trips all the way through the canyon. I've rafted the length of the canyon 12 or so times, certain sections more than 50 times on our rim and raft trips. Uh, Bill uh, Perkins and Compass, they've gone on, I don't even know how many trips. We used to do one or two each summer together. And what we show is the truth of God's word. Um, so th I'm going to give you the, the micro explanation of that area. The Grand Staircase, I've got to explain before I get to Grand Canyon. How many of you have been to Grand Canyon? It's one of the pillars of secular atheism. It's one of their five pillars. If, when you stand on the edge of the canyon, it's a mile down to the river. That mile, that's a big hole in the ground, isn't it? It's missing 900 cubic miles of sediments to leave that big hole behind. 900 cubic miles of sediments. That's nothing. There used to be two miles of strata above today's rim. Two miles that had been removed from southern Utah all the way to the sea. And it's not, this, this area isn't missing 900 cubic miles. It's missing 130,000 cubic miles of sediment. Grand Canyon's not even 1% of what's called the Grand Staircase. And it left behind steps where the erosion ended. At Bryce, a 2,500-foot step, you drop 40 miles south, you get the 2,500-foot cliffs at Zion. Drop 45 miles south, you get the 2,000-foot Vermilion Cliffs, etc. This depiction shows the, uh, the Grand Canyon, supposedly, there on the left. It's not really a particularly good depiction, but you notice how it doesn't cut into the plain? It cuts through that upwarp. That's called the Kaibab upwarp. So that two miles of, of strata was removed by late floodwaters running across what's now the southwestern United States. Continental drift had just taken place quickly during the end of the flood. Late floodwaters removed the two miles of strata and sediments leaving behind the grand staircase. Then the mountains arose. The Kaibab upwarp formed as that Colorado plateau uplifted. This is a satellite photo of Grand Canyon. You see the white area? That is snow, it's on the portion that was uplifted. Notice how the canyon cuts through the upwarp, not into the plain. And late floodwaters, there's several different theories, I'm not gonna cover them right now for time. Late floodwaters and, and water eventually cut through the upwarp, leaving behind Grand Canyon in a matter of days. And I cover this on our tours and also in our six day formation of Grand Canyon teachings. Oh, grow up. Science shows there's not enough water to cover the mountains. Well, you know something? There's not enough water to cover today's mountains. But the Bible says that the waters rush up by the mountains and down in the valleys at the end of the flood. We think the mountains arose and the thin layers, probably over the empty chambers of the deep, collapsed, forming today's ocean basins and the waters assuage. They slosh back and forth, eventually settling in to today's ocean basins. The world's tallest mountains are littered with seashells. Sacralists teach, so they slowly uplifted over millions of years. The erosion rate is, is faster than that. They would have eroded flat long ago. Um, only 29% of the Earth's surface is covered by land. 71% of Earth's surface is covered by water, lots of water. If the surface of the Earth was relatively flat, the water would be almost two miles deep over the whole planet. There is lots of water. And science now has discovered there's more water below the surface than is on the surface. There is plenty of water out there. So why in the world would you deny the global flood? 
because old earth beliefs have to have no global flood or it wipes them all out. So as a Christian, wouldn't it be better just to accept that God judged man's sin with a flood that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven and drop the death before Adam beliefs? Because the old earth beliefs are based on the belief that the layers form uniformly and no global flood, just like we're told in 2 Peter 3, scoffers would do. Hmm. You're an embarrassment to Christianity. Carbon dating proves our planet is not billions of years old. Well, first of all, carbon dating is only good for a few thousand years. So when someone tells you they've carbon dated something at 200,000 years or 2 million years or a billion years, you now know they have no clue what they're talking about. No wonder the Bible tells us to avoid oppositions of science, falsely so-called, not real science. In the last message I showed you, real science, operational science is your best friend, but historical science, assumptions, masquerading as science is where the controversy exists. In carbon dating, they measure the amount of carbon-14 in organic remains. It's manufactured in the atmosphere during the process of photosynthesis. Plants breathe in CO2. It contains trace amounts of carbon-14. When a plant is eaten by an animal or when an animal breathes, they get carbon-14 in them. We all have trace amounts of carbon-14 in us. But it Carbon-14 decays way over time. So when a plant or an animal dies, it stops eating and breathing and taking in new carbon-14. At least that's always been my observation. And over time, the carbon-14 decays away. Now, at the rate it decays away, it should be gone in about 80,000 years. I'm going to be as generous as possible. I'm going to give them 100,000 years. Let's say that after 100,000 years, there'd be no carbon-14 left if something is that old. However, recent... Uh, Recent studies have shown all the fossil-bearing layers down to the Cambrian that we're told is 570 million years old. They still find organic remains in them that have carbon-14, which means they can't be but a few thousand years old. Oh, and better yet, the same range of amount of carbon-14 from the top layer all the way through the bottom, which means they all formed in the same event. And the only way you can explain either of those is God judged man's sin with a flood of waters that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven, just like the Word of God says. Wow, see, when we compromise God's Word because secular atheists scare us or we don't want to have to stand up again, whatever the problem is, sometimes you just have to stand there and take their insults. Again, name-calling is the last bastion for those that have no evidence to put forth. Did you know that never has a natural gas or oil deposit or coal layer been found that doesn't still contain carbon-14? That should be gone in just a few thousand years. We told, we're told these things are hundreds of millions of years old, putting death before Adam in denial of the global flood. Hmm. Well, how do you explain the different human races? I get to ask, ask this quite a bit, and I, I think it's a great question. It's a very important question. First of all, let's look at Darwin's uh, first book, the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, they usually don't tout the second part of the title, which is, or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Hmm, favored races. If you think you're the most evolved, if you actually, if you hold the power, you can consider whatever race you might be to be the favored race. Biblically speaking, there is only one race. That's the human race. In Genesis, we're told God created man in his own image, male and female. So how do we explain races from a biblical standpoint? Well, again, in my opinion, there's one race. But at the start of the flood, all the fountains of the deep erupted. And this started dividing up the one continent that we call Pangaea today. Now, these waters were hot thermal waters, scalding hot waters. And as they erupted, they were warming up the oceans. As they estimated, the flood waters averaged about 100 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit which led to massive evaporation and cloud cover. These clouds were pouring rain down over the central regions and equator and pounding snow onto the poles, creating the one and only ice age. Sagaris teach the ice age is formed during a cooling cycle on Earth, right? Wouldn't a cooling cycle cool down the oceans? Wouldn't that end evaporation? So how did the ice get to the poles? takes warm oceans to form cloud cover to form the supposed ice age. 
Near the end of the flood, the earth's fractured plates along where the fountains of the deep had erupted, slid apart quickly in what today is called continental drift. They see it today, the continent's moving about a half inch a year based on uniformity. It's always moved a half inch a year. They're thousands of miles apart. They took hundreds of millions of years to drift apart. No, it happened quickly, not slowly. The Bible talks of Peleg. His name means furrowed or divided. For in his days, the earth was divided. Well, during Peleg's lifetime, languages were confused at the Tower of Babel. People wouldn't spread out. So God confused languages, forcing people groups to spread out around the globe. Now, at that time, the ocean waters were about 400 feet lower than they are today because the ice caps, it formed as a direct result of the global flood, hadn't started melting yet. So, people spread out, and as the waters slowly cooled down, because the fountains of the deep stopped erupting after the first 150 days. So, over the next few hundred years, the oceans were slowly cooling, and the evaporation became less and less until where the ice age ended. And then the ice caps started melting. The, the ice in the lower latitudes, which used to come down to Kansas City, Missouri, they melted back quickly. People had spread out around the globe and the ice caps melted. In fact, this secular textbook says 20,000 years ago, it was about 4,000, ice masses melted and the sea level rose. This is all perfectly scientific. It's just a matter of biased interpretation with their uh, 20,000 years ago. So the earth was then divided by languages, nations, islands, and continents in the days of Peleg. And people had to marry within the captured gene pool on their specific land mass or island. Slight micro adaptations, biblically correct micro change, we talked about that earlier today, became a part of their gene pools. And today, people come in various shades of skin, all made in the image of God. This is why we can do uh, blood transfusions or kidney transplants from people all over the globe. We did not evolve to different levels as Darwinists teach, even though they will deny it today for obvious reasons. And the differences that we have today come from the sorting of the loss of the four gene pools on Noah's Ark. There was Noah and his three sons and each of their wives. There were four gene pools on Noah's Ark. You note that? Four gene pools, that's where all of us have come from. In fact, National Geographic did a study of the human genome and came to the conclusion, all humans come from one of four distinct gene pools. <laughs> Real science of believers best friend. Well, if we didn't evolve to different levels, how do you explain all the cavemen? Well, first of all, let's say especially when people spread out the Tower of Babel, if your group didn't have the knowledge on how to build homes, or if you uh, didn't have the materials and you came to an area and there were some nice caves, it'd be real easy to make those your homes. And guess what you would be? You would be a caveman. King David was a caveman. Doesn't mean he was an ape, right? <laughs> to be honest, I think when someone asks me what about the cavemen, what they really mean is what about the ape men. Here's a textbook showing kids, humans connected to all sorts of critters like fish and, and worms and starfish with a nice red line for proof. How can you argue with a nice red line, right? I mean, it must be true. Let's look at some of the famous hominids that have misled so many. Hominids is the supposed closest link between ape and man, which I always find to be funny because if you ask a Darwinist, if we evolve from apes, how come we still have apes and humans? And they're going to say because we didn't evolve directly from apes. We had a common primate ancestor and humans went this way and apes went this way. Okay. And then they spend all their time trying to prove how we did evolve from apes. So I just, anyways, I just like to point out their inconsistencies there. But one of the first messiahs of Darwinism was the great Piltdown Man. From about 1912 to 1955, 
Piltdown the man was the Messiah of Darwinism, misled not millions, billions of people into rejecting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And then in the mid-50s, it was proven these jokers had taken the skull cap from a human, the jawbone of an orangutan, filed them down so they fit together, acid-treated both sides, buried them in a rock quarry in Piltdown, England, and waited two years and dug up Piltdown, man, and spent the rest of their lives as world-renowned Darwinists speaking on any college campus they wanted and misled not millions, billions of people. So many people were misled. We finally kicked creation and prayer out of our schools here on a total and complete fraud. Lewis Leakey, his, his parents were Christian missionaries to Africa, but he went off to Oxford and became convinced the earth was billions of years old and lost his faith, spent his life trying to refute the Bible by find, finding ape men. He came up in 1932. He found a, a crushed lower jawbone. It was broken up into about, about 50 pieces, but uh, it had all apes' teeth. So he reconstructed it, and it just happened to come out in the shape of a human jawbone with all apes' teeth. What were the odds? And thus was born Ramapithecus, the missing link, into textbooks for 45 years, misleading tens, hundreds of millions of people. And finally, in 1977, it was proven that was the jawbone from an orangutan. Wow, mind-boggling. So a, a kid studying to be a dentist hands me his advanced biology book and says, hey, Russ, find some Darwinian frauds in my biology book. Hey, listen, I don't have an opportunity to present these. I, I, could, I could go for a week with their frauds. Um, so I don't need more examples. I don't need more frauds. I, I don't have any place I can put them. But um, we... Um, I did flip, as we're talking, I'm flipping through his book, and there's the drawing of Ramapithecus' teeth. So that caught my eye, so I stopped and looked at it. Well, now it's been put back in the textbooks with a new name, Sivapithecus. And it says, Sivapithecus are more closely related to humans. This genus now includes the animal formerly known as Ramapithecus. Proven to be an orangutan in 1977, now put back and has branched off into ancestors. Hey, let me ask you a question. Why don't they get rid of the frauds and put in the real evidence of Darwinism? Have I mentioned they don't have any? Gene depletion plus natural selection makes Darwinism a scientific impossibility? That's the reason they have to have frauds in there. They should have trillions of evidences if it took place. Speaking of frauds, Lucy's been the Messiah of Darwinism since 1974. They found about 35% of, of a skeleton, and they said, well, the femur, the thigh bone, angles to the knee, and humans have angled thigh bones, proving it's an ape becoming a human. They forgot to mention all tree-dwelling apes have angled femurs. They said, well, the knee is slightly larger than a normal ape's knee, proving it's becoming a human. Well, everybody's knee in this room has, varies in size, been in age and sex and all sorts of things. This from 1987. Anatomists have concluded Lucy is not a link between ape and man and did not walk upright like a human. Yet here's a textbook showing a nice drawing of Lucy walking upright like a human and talking on a cell phone. What are, <laughs> what are the odds? Hey, also, you might notice that, that their proofs of Darwinism are almost always drawings. Yeah, yeah flip open a biology book. It's always drawings. Old saying, it goes like this. Darwinists are experts at drawing things that never existed to support their theory that never took place. Yeah, you take away their crayons, they've got nothing. <laughs> so in 2002, they announced Tomei Man, the oldest known hominid, making things always have to be the oldest or the newest. Say, that's where the money is. That's where the grant money is. But when they found it in 2002, Nature Magazine said, this is just an ancient ape. When they found it in 2002, Science News said the specimen's teeth are apes. It didn't walk upright like a human. It's just an ape. Total fraud. Uh, Frank, speaking of which, Frankfurt University's Professor Reiner Prosch von Zeiten was a world-renowned evolutionary anthropologist and carbon dating expert he was, he was credited with discovering the oldest known Homo sapien, making him a world-renowned anthropologist, which he dated at 36,000 years old. And then it was discovered this guy was a total fraud. This carbon dating expert didn't even know how to run the carbon dating equipment, so he was just making updates. <laughs> wow. One of the skulls he was touting came from a man who died in 1750. I believe the term is grave robber. 
Nebraska man was proof of Darwinism. All they found was a piece of a broken tooth. But from that, they reconstructed Nebraska man, his family, even the tools they would have worked with. And then it was proven that tooth came from an extinct pig. <laughs> There's a real Nebraska man right there. <laughs> this researcher honestly stated, in the not too distant past, there was almost no fossil material. Speculation was intense. And she went on to say, well, to be truthful, there's still not much real data, so speculation is still active. Active speculation translates into once upon a time, or in modern scientific vernacular, millions of years ago, because a fairy tale is about to follow. No wonder Dwayne Gish defined Darwinism as a sustenance of fossils hoped for, the evidence of links unseen. <laughs> Here's another. Though. Why should we waste our time on creation and evolution issues when we should be sharing the gospel? You ever hear that? I hear it all day long. Well, since 1963, when we kicked creation and prayer out of our schools, we've been teaching our kids they evolved over millions of years of death and suffering without God. This teaching dominates public institutions like Grand Canyon, which is why we take people there, and it dominates the media. This, this is a chart Remember, it was 1963, we kicked creation and prayer out, started teaching our kids they evolved without God. This is a chart showing the percentage of high school graduates in this country who believe the Bible was true. In 1962, two out of three U.S. high school grads believe the Bible was true. 20 years later, in 1982, it was one out of three. In 2002, it was one out of six. Today, it's about one out of 30. So do we really consider standing up for the truth on this a waste of time? Mind-boggling. Pew Research did a study on kids who had, in their 20s and 30s now, who had lost their faith due to these teachings. Asked them, what were the main reasons you left the church? And number one was that being taught Darwinian evolution was true. Number two was being taught that the Bible is not true based on Darwinian evolution. And number three was thinking the church has no answers. Well, the church has the answers, but they're blocking it. Why? Why is the church blocking it? Because of compromises with old earth beliefs. And you tell good from bad by the fruit. Over 90% of our seminaries teach old earth beliefs. I already... I, had a little bit of a debate with one such person earlier this morning. Graduated from Biola. He said, what do you think of Biola? I said, I think they've misled millions of, or thousands of kids. And he goes, you're attacking my school. No, I'm not. You asked me my opinion. I had another fellow come up to me just a few minutes ago before I started, said his sister went to Biola for one semester and now is a non-Christian. Wow. It's not Biola. It's an over 90% of our seminaries and Christian colleges. And their grads have filled the church and only 2% of churches will let this type of information reach their kids while they lose 90%. Anyone with me? Do we think we got a problem there? Do you think maybe Christians need to humble themselves to the Word of God and stop blocking this information? And kids are leaving thinking there's, there's no answer. I, on the rare occasions I'm allowed to speak to a youth group, I always have anywhere from 2 to 10 kids come up and say, man, I was never going to go to church again. I'll be back in church next week. And the youth pastors will be right there, and I'll say to them as they leave, so when can I speak to your youth group? We're not interested. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've only, it, it's rare I speak to a youth group. But when I do, it makes a huge impact. Because people consider it a waste of time. And it's not they consider it a waste of time. They've compromised. You know, Jesus tells us the parable of the sower, that a sower went out to sow seed. He didn't prepare the soil. He haphazardly spread the seed around. And you're always right to spread the seed. Don't get me wrong. But some fell by the wayside. Some of them were thorns. Some of them were in rocks. Some started to grow, but it never produced any fruit. When the going got tough, it withered up. But seed that fell on good soil bore fruit up to a hundredfold. I think Jesus is saying, prepare the soil, then plant the seed. You know, a farmer would never plant a seed on a rock-filled, thorn-choked field. He'd first remove the rocks and plow the soil. He would prepare the soil to plant the seed. Our ministry is attempting to prepare the soil when we're allowed to by teaching about creation, evolution, and age of the earth issues and providing a reason for the hope that's in the heart of all true believers. 
and all truth seekers. Let me end with these two questions. Isn't God just a crutch for weak-minded people who can't face reality? Well, no more than atheism is a crutch for weak-minded people who can't face their sin and the fact they're going to stand before a righteous judge and creator one day. This is Aldous Huxley, grandson of the famous atheist Thomas Huxley, who was known as Darwin's bulldog for his aggressive promotion of Darwinism. Aldo stated, for myself, the philosophy of meaningless, that is atheism, was an instrument, i.e. a crutch, of liberation, sexual and political. My friends, the Bible and the Word of God is, and God is not a crutch. It is a sure foundation because, again, sin is real. And the only answer is a relationship with our Creator, Lord, and Savior, Jesus Christ. So how can you, I'm going to end with this, how can you possibly explain a loving God in this world full of death and suffering? That's such a common question. 98% of Christians can't answer this today. You know why? Because of old earth beliefs. Let me explain. The answer is simply this. God didn't give us the world the way it is today, full of death and suffering. God gave us a perfect creation. Well, what happened to it? Adam's original sin. Adam's sin corrupted the creation, allowing death to enter, and that's why we live in a world full of death and suffering, yet we have a loving creator. How loving is that creator? Because that's the biblical answer right there, but it goes on from there. Then the rest of that answer is, despite our sin that corrupted the creation and brought death in, it also separated us from God, requiring we be redeemed with God. But we're all sinful. We can't redeem ourselves with God. There is nothing we can do to redeem ourselves with God. So God came to our rescue once again by sending his only begotten son to suffer and die on a cross, his shed blood covering the sin of those who believe in him. All he asks is that we believe in him. And my friends, that's the foundation of the gospel message. Old earth beliefs put death before Adam. And once you've accepted death before Adam, you can't believe Adam's sin brought in death. Do you see that? Satan is good at what he does. Put your trust in the word of God, my friends, word for word and cover to cover. Let me end my part with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day and every dear soul that's here today. I hope and I pray the information that myself and other speakers share will be a blessing and give us answers and information that we need so we can strengthen our own faith and lead others to saving faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his great name that I do pray. Amen. God bless you guys. You've been watching 60 Second Answers to the Toughest Bible Questions by Russ Miller. To view more stealing titles, get information on our Holy Land trips and future Bible conferences, go to compass.org.